I don't believe that homosexuality is the worst sin. But, but it is a sin. As is premarital sex, sex with multiple partners, pornography, cheating, lying, gossiping, being critical of other people, being mean-spirited, being deceitful. There are those who in, in our culture who would like us to say, look, alcoholism, that's a disease, it's not a sin. Drug addiction, it's a disease, it's not a sin. You're born with certain things and, and a proclivity to give in to certain things and so therefore it's not your fault. But when you see when you do that, you take away personal responsibility, don't you? The fact is, yeah, we are all born with a disease. It's sin. We all have within us some stuff from that time of birth. And all of us have to come to a reckoning point where we decide whether we're going to live with that or if we're going to come to Christ and ask Christ to set us free. Now, here's another thing we need to realize. That in a subject like this, that there are a lot of people who are hurting. There are people who have prayed night and day, please, God, take this desire for this person of the same sex away from me. They feel messed up and weird and sick or whatever other word you want to use for it. And, and people that are going through that kind of battle need to be what? Loved. Loved. Here's the thing that I'm pretty certain of. At least I know it's true for me. Everyone here has temptations for things, for sin, and probably has at one point in time prayed, God, take this desire away from me. Have you? That's why Jesus came and dies to pay the price of our sin. We're going to look at um, Mark chapter 2 today, and, and it's interesting because <laughs> Jesus is being questioned, and, and actually, they're really trying to divide him and John's disciples at the same time and get some people disturbed. And in chapter 2, verse 18... It says, now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, <laughs> the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. Please don't ask my opinion. When you ask my opinion on something, even if I don't have an opinion, I'm somewhat of a quick thinker. And I will start to think the various points through about something. And as I think it through, I will start to drill into a position. And once I come to that position and I respond with my opinion, I'm locked in, folks. <laughs> and then I'm going to start to defend that opinion. So 
just don't ask my opinion, okay? So that way it won't be locked in, all right? But once I've thought, I'm going to be locked in there. And I'm going to be like the old wineskin who can't stretch because I've got my opinion set. And someday I'll remind you what an opinion is. Oh, I'll go ahead and tell you now. <laughs> an opinion is not wisdom from God. Opinions are wisdom from God. Opinions are not wisdom from God. So just don't ask my opinion, okay? <laughs> don't cause me to be that old garment that you try to put something new on and it's going to tear off and mess up both of them. Don't cause me to lose the wine that's been placed in this skin because it can't stretch. And you understand that, right? But they, that, that's, they would take like a goat skin, literally, skin, okay? Sew it. And the neck would be where you'd uh, drink the wine out of. And the other part of it, you'd sew it all shut. So, and then you'd put new wine in there. Grape juice, literally. And then you'd let it sit in there. And what does it do in there? It ferments. Fer excuse me, ferments. Okay? It turns to wine. And, and the longer it ferments, the more alcoholic it is, right? <laughs> okay? Well, okay. So you, you, you sewed up a brand new skin. And you put that, that juice in there. And what's the juice going to do as it's fermenting? It's going to give off gas. Now, that, shouldn't that warn us about? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So it's going to start to give us air and it's going to expand. And if you are a dried old wineskin that's already stretched out, what's going to happen? It's going to break. The threads are going to break. The, the, somewhere the, the, the hide itself is just going to split because it's dried and old. Now, why don't the disciples fast? That's the question. Why don't they fast? Look, John the Baptist's disciples, they're fasting. The Pharisees' disciples, they're fasting. Jesus, why aren't your disciples fasting? Did you know that fasting was only required once a year? Once a year. Well, at least that's according to the Bible, <laughs> okay? The, the law said once a year. Do you know when it was? Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. It was a day of repentance for sins, and then the whole nation, or I should say all of Israel, would come to the temple, and they would come there for what? And, and look, Jews still do this to the day. Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. And they come and they ask for God to forgive all of their sins for that year until they come back the next year <laughs> and give them to forget. So notice, notice, the time of fasting was at Yom, Yom Kippur. What's that mean? Fasting was really about repentance, wasn't it? It was about having a heart for God. It was about being broken about the things that God's broken about. Not hiding them, not ignoring them, not denying them, but facing the fact that there's stuff in their life that God needs to cleanse and forgive. And so you fast and you pray about those things on one day. Well, the, the Pharisees, the Pharisees, you know, they're a little more religious than the rest of us. Okay? A little more holy. A little more special, I guess. And so they fasted two days a week. Whoa, hey, they're special, aren't they? <laughs> okay? Two days a week. I think it was Monday and Thursday, if I remember correctly. Two days a week. And when they fasted, oh man, they wore clothing to let you know it. It showed on their faces. It was obvious. Wait a second. God said fast one day a year. And the Pharisees say fast how often? <laughs> Two days a week. That's over a hundred odd times, right? <laughs> I wonder which one was the most important fast. The one for show or the one for repentance, which God called for. So take note. Why aren't your disciples fasting? Well, here's what Jesus responds. Oh, I got I to gotta tell you this one too, though. <laughs> Jesus is against fasting. For show. For show. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. When you fast, ah, he's not really against fasting, is he? He's against fasting for show. 
So he actually says, when you fast, okay, it's, it's something he actually expects you to do. But he says, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces so they show others they are fasting. Look at me, I'm hungry. I've been fasting for the last hour. <laughs> right after breakfast, I started. <laughs> Gonna end it at lunch. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> They disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Oh, by the way, it was a fast during the day. As soon as the sun went down, and in daylight savings, it's earlier, right? Okay, as soon as the sun goes down, then they ate. Whoopee, you fasted for 12 hours. Oh, I'm sorry you're in such pain. When you fast, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in heaven. Excuse me, in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, who sees what is done in secret, and he will reward you. Thank you, Jesus. Doug, Doug joins um, in his message about this. He says, um, he says, the Bible says that this annual fast symbolizes three things. Yom Kippur is talking about. First, it expresses humility before God. Second, it is a personal sacrifice before the Lord. It's like the offering the Jews would give in the temple, a perfect lamb or baby goat or a dove. In this case, they gave up eating as an offering to the Lord. And third, it is a symbol of grieving over sin. The Day of Atonement is focused on forgiveness of sin. It represents their desire to look at their lives and repent. Jesus actually is going to respond by kind of saying, he doesn't use the words like this, but it's really what he says. He says, do you remember what John said? Incidentally, do you, any of you remember what John said? His last recorded words in the Bible before he goes off to prison? His disciples come to him and say, you know what, there's that Nazarene guy, he's out there by the Sea of Galilee, and more people are following him than are following you, and more people are getting baptized out there than they were by you, and John, shouldn't we be upset about this? And do you remember how John responds? John responds, chapter 3, verse 28 of John. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater and I must become less. Jesus, in responding to this question, says, guys, bridegroom. Now, John's disciples, as soon as he uses that word bridegroom, he doesn't even have to say anymore. As soon as they, he they hear that, it's like, bridegroom, oh my. That's, that's what John said. Now, John's disciples, they may, be, they may be already mourning the loss and the death of John the Baptist. They are definitely mourning the fact that he's in prison. And they're saddened by that. But their ears prick up literally because he says, bridegroom. And John has said, the bridegroom is coming and I'm the best friend of the bridegroom and, and I'm excited about the bridegroom. I'm celebrated. There's joy with the bridegroom coming. And Jesus, what will he do? He will say, folks, you don't fast at a wedding party. Right? Go to a reception, a wedding reception, right? Where they have food. And you say, no, this is a sad time. And I'm not eating. <laughs> and I'm not going to be happy. Oh, my goodness, then go home. <laughs> okay? What are you doing here? In fact, did you know that in spite of what the Pharisees taught, that during the week after a wedding, and that, see, they went for a whole week of partying, uh, that was expensive. <laughs> During the week after the wedding, you didn't have to fast. Even the Pharisees said, look, when we're in a, at the wedding, that's supposed to be the, one of the most joyful times for a couple. That's supposed to be an exciting, happy time for them. It's a celebration, and the whole community should be celebrating it. And the best friend surely ought to be, and that's John the Baptist, 
And so John's disciples are saying, oh my, he's talking about the bridegroom. And Jesus says, when the bridegroom's here, you party. You get excited. It's a time full of joy. It's not a time to be, oh, we're fasting. And he's getting through to them. And he goes on from there, doesn't he then? <laughs> Do you remember what Jesus said when he was at Nazareth? <laughs> kind of got him driven out of town, by the way. He quoted Isaiah 61. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness of the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment a praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And what is Jesus reminding them of? Guys, I'm the bridegroom. And because I'm here, my disciples are going to celebrate. They're going to rejoice because I came to bring joy. I came to bring, bring release from captivity. I came to set people free. I came to comfort. I came to help them when they're hurting and mourning. I came to give them joy. So they celebrate. So leave them alone. Oh, but he goes on. He'll use a couple more examples, won't he? I have taken a bunch of time this week kind of struggling and saying, what's the new wine? Because Jesus is going to go on in his conversation. He's going to say, you know, you don't put new wine into old wineskins because they'll bust. So you put new wine in new wineskins. Um, I, I even, you know, I was praying about that and I, Lord, oh, boy, I sure want to be new wine. I sure don't want to, or excuse me, new, I want to be a new wineskin. I don't want to be so opinionated and locked in that I'm not open to what new things you would want to do. And especially in this world, I don't want to miss it. I surely don't want to teach untruths or things that are old wine. So what's the new wine? There was a moment in my thinking and praying this week. I said, well, it, it, God, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of people who are moving towards a place of just wanting us to say marriage of two men or two women is good. It's an okay thing, and, and we should embrace it and welcome it. It's, it. And there are people who, if we are trying to understand this text, who would call that the new wine. And we need to accept the new wine. I'm like, wow, God, if that's the new wine, okay. And, and frankly, wouldn't it be easier just to be accepting of that? Wouldn't it be easier for the couple who, uh, who said, okay, I'm sorry, we just, we just don't do weddings for people of the same sex. Wouldn't it be easier for them just to do it? You realize they're going to have to pay $135,000. Came down this last week. A fine. They've already lost their business. Shut it down. Couldn't continue. Oh my goodness, the hatred that they received. And we talk about, sometimes we Christians are hateful. The hate mail, the people that protested out in front of them without ever knowing them. Brutal. It would have just been a lot easier just to give in. What's the new wine? Is the new wine sexual promiscuity? Well, guess what, folks? They were sexually promiscuous in Jesus' day, and he taught against it. They had temple prostitutes, both male and female, and taught against it. And he taught a new way of living, and he taught about freedom. ISIS killed some more Christians. Boko Haram slaughtered young Christians who would not reject Christ and follow Islam. 
we're in a dangerous and an evil world, and it's only going to get worse if we're getting closer to the return of Christ. So what's the new wine? Is it about some different lifestyle? Is it about some different philosophy? Is it about saying something that Jesus did call sin no longer a sin? What's the new wine? Do you know? Jesus is the new wine. Jesus is the new wine. Romans 13, 14. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Jesus is the bridegroom. And that's why the disciples are supposed to celebrate while he's there. Jesus is the new clothing. Romans, clothe yourselves literally with Jesus Christ. Jesus is that new wine. What did he say? I, he takes and he pours this cup and he shares it with his disciples right before he goes to the cross and he says, this, this, this glass of wine, this goblet of wine, this is the new covenant bought and paid for in my what? Blood. Jesus is the new wine. Hebrews 12, 2 says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He gives us this incredible new thing if we'll receive him, if we'll allow him to cleanse us, if we'll allow him to make us new. Folks, we need to learn to live for Christ and not for personal self-gratification. And you know what? There's not a person in this room who's not vulnerable to that. To feeding their own gratification rather than Christ and serving him. The Pharisees did it. They were committed to pride and they show off when they're fasting. But Peter says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders, all of you. Clothe yourselves with what? Humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. The proud say, I don't need God. The proud can be Christians who say, I don't need to change. I'm fine. I'm at least better than the guy next to me. Pride. God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Folks, we need to drink new wine. We need to celebrate the bridegroom. We need to get ready for the wedding of the Lamb. It's Revelation 19. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and the loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah! For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give Him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. And incidentally, Revelation then gives this little parenthetical comment. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. The things we do clothe us. I need to read all of chapter three of Colossians. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Have you? If you've said yes to Christ's death on the cross for you, believed in his resurrection, then it says you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. Not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. Anger. Folks, there's a lot more sin than sex. Are you listening? Get, 
Get rid of these things. Anger, rage, malice, slander. Uh, if I talk about you to somebody else, I'm slandering you. If I talk about you in a bad way, okay? If I say, if, 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 what's that? He said, not if it's true. <laughs> if I'm talking the truth about you to somebody else, and it's, and it's still gossip, it's slander. Do not, so I, I skipped one, and filthy language with your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, watch it, clothe yourselves with compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. That's what the world ought to see the way we're dressed. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through song psalms, hymns, songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. Amen. They don't fast because the bridegroom's here, but they're going to. The time will come when they will fast. And what is Jesus referring to? Time is going to come when I'm going to die and they are going to grieve intensely. They're going to be in pain. They're not even going to want to eat because they're going to watch me be tortured and crucified and die. And they're going to fast. And then there will be a time until the bridegroom comes back where there will need to be times of fasting, times of repentance like in Joel, where Joel calls the people to a solemn assembly and to a holy fast because of their sin. And maybe we're in one of those times, folks. As our courts make decisions, are we in a time where we need to fast? And pray. Jesus said some demons won't come out unless you fast and pray. There are times that we need to fast. Is this one of those times? Is this time? Ecclesiastes. There is a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. Some of you are saying, and a time to end the sermon, Bill. <laughs> The disciples will mourn and they will fast. Ecclesiastes goes on in verse 11, chapter 3. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. There's a hunger in us all to know God. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. Is this a time to fast, folks? Well, I, let me remind you of the purpose of fasting. To repent. 1 John 1.9 
if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If I tell you that what you are doing, which is a sin, and I tell you it's not a sin, oh, whew, thanks, I've been feeling bad about this for decades. Nope, it's not a sin. You're lying? Oh, it's no longer a sin. I know you thought it was, but that's old wine, okay? Or excuse me, that's old wine skin. But it's not a sin. Oh, prostitution? Oh, sell yourself. You know, who cares? You know, you'll make more money doing that than anything else anyways. You know, or, or whatever it might be. We say, sin is no longer a sin. Then what have I just done to that person? But kept them from what? If we confess our sins, that means agree with God, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When I tell people it's not a sin, I hinder them from receiving forgiveness. That's pretty serious, folks. Is this a time to fast? God Again, Lord, you know, my heart is about love and not wanting to offend and 